Okay, hello again, everybody. Um, time to answer the question from our previous lecture. But before I do, uh, I will just point out that I listened a little bit to what I recorded for that first lecture. And I noticed that um, because I'm recording the output, the audio output of the computer, uh, as well as making a recording through the computer microphone, there's a little bit of reverb uh, whenever I play sounds from uh, the lecture notes. Uh, so they uh, sound a little bit cooler than uh, I really intended, and they may not sound exactly like they would if you download these notes and play them by yourself um, at home uh, from the notes directly, but it's not a big deal, so I'm not going to worry about it. I am uh, going to focus a little bit more on the answer to this question. Uh, so we we're talking about harmonics and spectral change, uh, and we said, well, um, there's this property that harmonics have in any complex wave such that their integers are always going to be evenly spaced um, apart from each other in the frequency scale. Uh, so if we want to get spectral change in speech, uh, how do we do it? Uh, and the answer is we change the other dimension of what we see in a spectrum. So we can change the intensity of the harmonics. Uh, so you can take a listen to this. Hopefully it'll sound okay when I play it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you may have heard um, something like that before. Um, this is uh, sometimes referred to as overtone singing or um, sometimes as throat singing. Uh, it is um, part of the musical tradition or culture of uh, the people of Tuva, which is a region of um, Russia in Siberia near Mongolia, and you hear it in Mongolia too, apparently. Uh, I haven't been over there to verify this personally, but this is what they tell me. Um, at any rate, uh, I don't think this is a Tuvan throat singer. This is just um, somebody, I think, from the Netherlands, actually, who was able to train himself to do this. And I'll play the sample again. Uh, and I'll also mention, as I do so, that uh, the very first time I taught 341 at the University of Calgary, I had a student who got really interested in, in this phenomenon, and uh, he trained himself to do it. Uh, he was from Calgary and just spent a lot of time in his basement with the Internet uh, learning how to do it. Uh, and I've got some samples from him that I'll, um, I'll play later on. Anyways, uh, we're going to listen to this again, uh, and I'm going to show you the spectrogram of this sound file as we do so. Uh, and I'm going to follow along as we play it. So basically, this gives you a better representation of sort of the intensity dimension of the spectrogram, which means that if it's darker, there's more intensity at that frequency. And if it's lighter, there's less intensity at that frequency. And I'll play this, and you can hear what this um, singer is doing. Uh, he's kind of going up the scale of uh, harmonics um, as he sings through this uh, particular uh, stretch of music or whatever you want to call it. Okay, I'll do that one more time uh, and just kind of explain that uh, what he does with his F0 is that he tries to keep it at a monotone. Uh, and what that's going to do is create a complex wave which has a series of harmonics which are evenly spaced um, apart from each other in the frequency scale. Uh, and he's trained himself to have the ability um, to kind of walk his way up that um, harmonic scale so that he's focusing uh, intensity or he's making specific harmonics uh, more intense uh, one by one, one after another as he goes up the frequency scale. So. Uh, at this point, he's emphasizing this harmonic. At this point, he emphasizes the next harmonic up in the frequency scale. At this point, he emphasizes the next harmonic up again. But overall, the F0 just remains flat. Okay, I'm going to play it one more time. And I will also ask, as I do so, if this sounds, um, when you listen to it, if, it, if you stop thinking of it as in terms of music, but rather in terms of, say, speech or vowels, if any particular stretches of this singing sound like particular vowels to you. Uh, so here we go. Use your imagination, or maybe just use your perception. Yeah, so you can see a little bit of waver in the frequency scale, and you can hear it a little bit when he sings too. Um, but to my ears, and I think to others as well, uh, what you generally hear is that he's kind of uh, producing something like an O or an O here in terms of the vowel. In the middle, he's producing like an ER, uh, and over here, he's producing like an E. So this is the last time we'll play this.
so yeah, uh, I think most of us don't have the ability to do this. I don't know how much time exactly you spent in your parents' basement, so maybe you do. But um, what we do have the ability, what we do every single day of our lives, every single, um, well, not every minute of our lives, but we all have the ability to speak and to change the quality of the sound coming out of, out of our mouths. Uh, what we don't normally do when we do that is keep our voices at a monotone, but um, what we are changing are which harmonics in speech or which frequencies in speech we're trying to emphasize or intensify uh, as we speak. And that gives us different qualities of vowels and other you know, consonantal sounds. Uh, and the way we do it, the way we change the intensity of a specific harmonic or frequency is through this phenomenon of resonance. Okay, so I'll get to resonance in a second. I'll show you a little bit more of how this kind of corresponds to sort of normal speech. Uh, here's a few uh, fake vowels that I've created, like I did in the previous um, video, where I'm just constructing three different um, sine waves, um, adding them together into a complex wave. And if I get them at basically the right frequencies and more or less the right intensities, they're gonna sound sort of like speech. So that should sound like E. You can tell me what you think this vowel sounds like. Or maybe this one. This one's maybe a little more convincing than this one, but what you're supposed to hear, something like ooh, and this one should give you something like an ah. This is kind of our vowel triangle here. E, ooh, ah. And all I'm changing here are which frequencies the sine waves are found at, basically. For E, I've got a low one here. The second one is relatively high, the third one way up there. For O, I've got two down low on the frequency scale, and the third one in between 2,000 and 3,000 hertz. For ah, this first or lowest um, frequency sine wave is relatively high, and the second is still relatively low. Uh, and then the third one is up here around 3,000 hertz again. Um, it sounds more, well, maybe a little more speechy if you change the frequencies of these sine waves over time. So we can listen to what happens when we do that at kind of a low, a mid, and a higher frequency. So this one's a little bit noisy. You can kind of see the noise here in the spectrogram. Um, this is the frequency changes, which hopefully you can focus in on. Let me try this one. And I think this one's nice because you can hear it's going up and down like a whistle. Uh, so this is higher frequency in the spectrogram. This is lower frequency and it just kind of bounces up and down. And this one's really high. And it kind of starts to sound like a bird uh, whistling or chirping or what have you, twittering maybe. Okay, put them all together, you get this. Uh, this just consists of those three sound files I played uh, for you on the previous slide. Uh, superimpose them on each other and you get something that sounds like speech. Um, so all three of those uh, are in there. Um, from the previous slide and if you listen to this a lot if you just want to like waste time have some fun uh, You can try to kind of zoom in perceptually on the specific frequencies that you're hearing So maybe focus on the lower frequency scale and you might be able to pick out that lowest frequency sine wave from the slide before just Where are you? Or maybe not um, try to focus on the really high-pitched one Where are you? That might jump out at you a little bit Where are you? The one that's really hard to pick out as just um, frequency changes in a sine wave is this middle guy. Uh, we'll do it again. Where were you a year ago? Where were you a year ago? If you listen to this a lot, a lot, a lot, and I have at some point in my life done so, uh, you can kind of start to get this one pretty easily, and after over time you can get this one. Uh, this one almost always sounds like speech. So this was originally... Um, uh, so this is called sine wave speech. Uh, it just consists of three sine waves varying in frequency over time. Um, like I said, this was discovered in Haskins Labs, um, kind of like in the late 70s. Uh, I don't know exactly what inspired them to try this in the first place, but it was kind of an interesting uh, study according to legend uh, because it was run in um, something called the Speech Research Lab, uh, in part uh, in Indiana University where I used to uh, be employed. Uh, but to sort of, when, when they played these sounds to people originally, they weren't really sure if they would hear them as speech 
Uh, so they kind of covered up all the things saying speech research lab at the lab, uh, just not to bias anybody in any way. And then they played these sounds to people and they asked them what did they hear. And some people were just like, oh, that's, you know, birds whistling or robots, you know, droning on or whatever. Uh, but then some people will get it as speech. And then usually as soon as you get it as speech, you can't unhear it as speech. Uh, you can do this little experiment I was talking about where you try to just listen to the individual whistles. <laughs> But if your mind wants to hear it as speech, it's going to tell you it's speech. Uh, it's going to kind of take that over. Um, yeah, so uh, I will um, play as well the uh, original from which that um, sine wave speech file was uh, generated. Where, Where were, were you, you a year ago? ago. Uh, and you can kind of see in this original, here's that lowest frequency uh, or what corresponds to that lowest frequency um, chirp. And then this is the second one, which kind of bounces up and down nicely. And you can kind of see on top of that, it doesn't stand out as nicely, that third highest frequency whistle. Um, so with this, again, you can maybe pick out the individual whistles that you put together to make this thing up. Where were you a year ago? Um, but if you try that with this, where, where were you a year ago? You are not going to be able to hear individual whistles at lower, mid, or high frequencies. It's going to sound like speech. Where, where were you a year ago? no matter how many times you listen to it. Uh, yeah, this is the spectrogram for it though. And as you see, we've got um, the intensities changing over time. But I will ask you kind of as um, the coda to this particular video, what you're also seeing is that um, this spectrogram is a little more fleshed out. So we have just three sine waves here bouncing up and down in frequency. Uh, we've got more in this particular one though, right? So we've got these kind of intense regions here uh, that are bouncing up and down, but then we've got um, these sort of horizontal lines uh, stacked on top of each other, which are usually not as intense or maybe particular parts of them are intense. Uh, so my question about for you to end this uh, video is what are these horizontal gray lines? Uh, what are they doing in here? What do these signify that makes this sort of more fleshed out than just the sine wave version of speech? Answer coming up in the next video.